Today, I'll talk to food pro Shay Spence. That's coming up on this episode 405 of WW Prep to Go. Hello and welcome to WW Prep to Go, where we talk strategy and ideas for people playing their Disney World trips. I am your host, Shannon Albert from WDWPrepSchool.com. Thank you for being here for episode 405. Today is an interview. It's been a little while since I had an interview. I like doing them. I love mixing it up and having all different kinds of episodes, but it is sometimes hard to find people that I want to talk to and people interested in talking to me, but I've been trying to, to track down Shay since last year. And we were able to finally connect for this episode. If you don't know Shay, he is a food pro and we talk about his career, including his time as the food editor at People Magazine. He was on a Gordon Ramsay cooking show last year. He has a large internet following because of his food related content. But part of that is also Disney related. And so we have that coming up in just a moment. As always, a reminder to follow on social media and a reminder that we do have a Patreon. There is a video version of this podcast up on Patreon, and we also have a weekly podcast that we do there, a private Facebook group, meetups in person, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of stuff going on over there. So if you would like to join us, we would love to have you. I think that is it. Without any further ado, here's my chat with Shay. Welcome to the podcast, Shay. Hello, I'm so happy to be here finally. Yes, we've been trying to make this work for a while and finally it worked in your schedule. So I'm yeah, happy to be able to talk to you. Yes, and now we have even more, even more to talk about than we when we originally tried to set up an interview. So perfect. it all works out. So um, you and I have known each other on social media for a while, but for people that don't already know you, what's your like elevator pitch of what you do? My elevator pitch, um, I do, well, I think I've stretched myself way too thin because I do way too much now, but um, I was originally the food editor for People Magazine, which was sort of how I got into like Disney through a weird route because I was like the one Disney fanatic on staff. So anytime we wanted to do a story about Disney, I would be like, put me in, I want to go down there. And of course, like Disney coverage did really well. So um mm-hmm. They wanted me to keep doing it and keep covering it. And eventually during COVID, when we all went remote and there wasn't a lot of travel going on, I had all these videos from Disney that I started posting on TikTok. And I think at that time there was like a lot of nostalgia. The parks were closed. And so they were going viral and I was getting all these followers from my Disney TikToks. And uh, yeah, now I, I, I just have been growing my following. I also do a lot of cooking content alongside that. So it all is sort of under the lens of travel and food. But I do full-time social now. I do a lot of Disney coverage. I do a lot of other travel. And mostly just, I live in Key West, so I kind of have a laid-back island lifestyle. And I like to uh, show off what I'm eating in my favorite restaurants and my favorite recipes. And a lot of that has to do with Disney, just because that's what I like. Um, so you are in Key West, which is a very fun backdrop for your home videos and content. But you're from Texas, which is where I live. So how did oh, you make? How did you? Wait, I didn't know you lived in Texas. I live in Fort Worth. That's why we like each other. Oh. I live in Fort Worth. Awesome. Yes. How did you? So your family still lives there because you keep traveling back to see them. But how did you end up yeah. in Key West? My family born and raised Austin. My parents went to UT in like 1970 or something, and never left. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, one of some of the rare people that have been in Austin for generations and I still go back and visit all the time. It's completely different than it ever was mm-hmm. when I was there, but you know, I, I, I love it. I love Texas and, um, I wouldn't necessarily move back there just because I have my dream house in Key West, but mm-hmm. otherwise I would love to move back to Texas. And you just got married. I did. Which and congratulations. So excited for you. It was like forever ago. It was November. And I was like, yeah, we haven't even gotten our one year anniversary yet. But no. we've all been together for we were together you know, for 10 years before that. So it was sort yeah. of Yeah. I got married. Formality, but also a really big fun party 
and we had it down in Key West and we got married on a tiki boat. It was so and fun. It was, yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, I was many, like, well, many people were saying it was the best wedding they've ever been to. Oh, nice. It looks fun. Everyone, I don't know if everyone hears that about their wedding, I, 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 there's a bit enough that I'm kind of feeling pretty cocky I, about. I think it was, it looked like it was so non traditional and focused on fun. Yeah, we just, I obviously wanted the food to be really great. So we had tons of local vendors from Key West. There. We got married down at the um, southernmost, well, they used to be called Southernmost House. And now it's called the Mansion on the Sea. It's this little boutique hotel. If you're ever in Key West, it's my favorite place to stay. It was the first place James and I ever stayed when we visited. Just by chance, we found it on like Hotel Tonight. And then it's like so beautiful. It's historic. And they have this lobster pizza that I always post on my TikTok and my Instagram. And like, I pretty, not to brag, but they told me I made it go viral. So like, whenever I go there, everyone's like going there for the lobster pizza and saying they saw it on my TikTok. So uh, we had tons of lobster pizza at the wedding. It was, yeah, it was just a big Key West affair. I liked going there when Disney Cruises used to go there. I know. That was well, nice. Like, they, you know, we do have, cruises coming back here for a while there was a hiatus uh, mm -hmm. i don't know if disney's planning on coming back but um i, I don't know either but the the i liked it because the cruises out of galveston went all the way over there into castaway key and the whole thing and i don't even think they do that hardly ever anymore so no. anyway that was a fun way to see qs because it's a bit of a trek to get down there by car it is it's a, it's a little bit of a pain but there is a lot you can do in a day and like that's that's what some of the itineraries I do uh, for people that are just here for like, you know, however long you are on, in, um, on a cruise port stop, there's a lot you can hit up. It's a small island, so it's, a, it's the perfect cruise port. So let's talk a little bit about your career, because you mentioned that you were the food editor at People Magazine. So what was your trajectory from starting to be in that position? Well, I went sort of a roundabout way to get into like New York magazines and media because I went to culinary school. Mm -hmm. um, just a six, I did like a six month culinary program at the Institute of Culinary Education in New York. And then after that, they like pair you with externships. And most people go into a restaurant or whatever. And I sort of knew that I, my demeanor is not that of a restaurant chef or a line cook. I have done it before and. Okay, but that's super funny since you ended up on a Gordon Ramsay show, which we will talk about in a minute. <laughs> yeah, we can get there. We can get there. Um, there's a reason I moved to like a very laid back island because that, that sort of high pressure intensity situation is not for me, but I ended up. At the extern, my externship I did at Rachel Ray's test kitchen for her magazine. So I was basically testing all her 30 minute meals, um, doing all that. And I'm a big writer. So eventually I was like, can you let me write for the magazine? And I begged them enough. And they finally let me like write the little indexes in the back of the magazine. And then I became the assistant to the editor in chief who wasn't Rachel actually it was another woman I became her assistant and then they let me write more articles and then I was still working in the test kitchen simultaneously and I had this weird hybrid job that like only I could do at that point so um then this spot opened up as the food editor at People Magazine and a woman who had formerly worked at Rachel Ray hired me there and yeah, I was there for about six years as the food editor doing a lot of, you know, this is what uh, the Kardashians ate at Nobu last night or their favorite salad or things like that. Or but then I got to work with a lot of celebrity chefs and uh, interview Ina Garten at her house in the Hamptons. And I do all of these things that I just never could have imagined. Um and yeah, so and you became the resident Disney expert, and I became the resident Disney expert. See, I have a lot of interests here that I've I've been trying to combine into one weird little uh, amalgam of things, and that's sort of what I do on on social now too. I can't. Everyone says you have to pick a pick a niche, and I can't seem to do that because once I get oversaturated with one, then I move to the other, and then I move back to the other one, and move back to the 
to Kelsey. I mean, I think you have. It's the intersection of travel and food. Yeah, I guess that's it. I, and media. Sometimes I, I think it would be much easier if I could just like focus on Disney or just focus on, you know, writing a cookbook or doing this. But my brain doesn't work that way, sadly. So you've uh, created the ideal job for you then. Exactly. As have I, because I just, if I want to do yeah. something, I do it. And I've been doing it for 12 years. So and I have a feeling. Amazing. Yeah. I have a feeling you will be doing it a long time as well. So you were there for six years. And yeah. did you not? So it was while you were still like at the end of that position that you started posting content? I was posting content. Well, when I started, I had my just like normal account. But I didn't post anything that interesting there. But uh, if I like met celebrities, I would post selfies with them. <laughs> but TikTok, uh, it, was TikTok where you really took off? TikTok was, TikTok changed my life. Uh-huh. Absolutely. I, well, my first time going viral was on Instagram before I had a TikTok um, through this thing called the Pizza Dia, which was going viral on Twitter. It was this really nasty looking, uh, this was probably 2016 when these viral recipes were like all over Twitter. And it is basically, uh, they made like a pepperoni pizza stuffed inside of a cheese quesadilla, breaded and deep fried. And it was like this really, it was really this sick looking thing that everyone was like, who would ever make that? So I was like, I'm going to make that on my Instagram stories, just kind of like as a joke. And then Chrissy Teigen retweeted me saying this guy's making it on his Instagram story. And so I got like, I think, at that time, I had had like 5,000 followers. And the next morning, I had like 30,000 followers. So that was my first like foray into uh, going like viral, the little viral stuff. And then, right. uh, you know, it's sort of like an addiction after that. Once I got to TikTok, and then it was so easy to go viral, and it's sort of like a slot machine. You're just trying mm -hmm. to, you know, keep that high going. And uh, thankfully, I think it was just like the perfect storm at the right time. Kind of, it's a, a lot of dopamine hits. Dopamine hits. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. There's a downside to that because if you don't do well, oh, then you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're constantly chasing it. It's never in, you know. It's a bit of an addiction. Um, you have to sort of, you know, set quotations. But yeah. So I uh, sim eventually, simultaneously, I had this job and my socials are taking off at the same time. And that led to two roads diverged that I had to choose between. As someone who made the decision to jump from corporate to being my full-time creator, I know how scary it is. So what led to that decision to just leap? Well, um, I was getting, first of all, media in New York as prestigious as a job, no matter how prestigious your job is, your salary is not great. And they don't really give you, uh, um, <laughs> raises very often and there are so few jobs in traditional media that they don't really need to because people don't leave that off and they hold on for dear life um and so i started you know getting offers to make money to monetize my social channels through partnerships and things like that mm -hmm. and uh, i was not allowed to at my old job so it really was a decision i had to mm -hmm. they, they you know, it's a conflict of interest. They say if you're working with brands and also writing about the same brands for a big uh, magazine. So they basically said, if you accept this brand partnership, then you have to leave the company. And that was the scariest decision I've ever made because I was really, really, really nervous that I didn't know if, like this was one thing that and there could not, there could have not been anything else after that, but <laughs> Uh, I took the leap. I trust my gut. And um, I think I made the right decision. I I work harder than I ever have, but I'm so happy. And, you know, the harder you work, the more you make, which is not how it is necessarily in the traditional corporate landscape. Yeah, you are in control. Exactly. Uh, more in control. Um. You mentioned earlier that when you worked at People, you liked writing. Do you miss writing? I do. I've been trying to get back into it. I actually am doing a freelance article for People right now. I'm doing freelancing for Food and Wine. For a while, I was like, I'm, 
out. I need to get out of this world for a little bit. Cause when I was writing or editing, you know, five to seven articles a day at people and it was just, it, my brain was exhausted of that. Now I'd be like, all right, we can dip our toes back in. I do like writing. I love travel writing. I love, um, you know, all that comes with that. And I have, you know, connections at food and wine. And so that's, that's sort of where I've been doing again, dipping mm -hmm. my toes into writing. It's one of your many interests. So that's it's another thing when, when I have spare time. Yeah. So with the rise of social media and digital content creators like you are now, um, how do you see food journalism evolving? Is it going away from those sort of, you know, big names and media companies? Here's what I have to say. Like when I was applying for jobs in food media, traditional food media in what was that, 2012, people were saying it's dying. There's no jobs. People are still saying that and there are fewer jobs, but they exist. Um, you know, it's, it's constantly evolving. And the truth is that unless you're one of the lucky people who has one of those coveted jobs in traditional media that they can hang on to for a while, uh, you do need to build up your socials. And that's what I tell anybody who wants to work in this industry. I'm like, yeah, like try all the avenues, but the best avenue and no one ever wants you to tell a kid, yeah, you should try to be a TikTok star. That's not even necessarily what I'm saying, but you should absolutely have your brand online on socials and even before, because even, I guess I skipped a part because before I got the job at Rachel Ray, I had a blog where I would just write recipes sort of tied into cultural, pop cultural events. And uh, which explains that, how you ended up at people. And that was how, <laughs> that, well, that was why I actually got the, finally got the job at people because they saw that I could write about celebrities and pop culture mm -hmm. and about food. And there was this one job as a food editor at People Magazine that I didn't even know existed. And I didn't imagine it existed when I started my blog. So it was like very serendipitous in that way. Mm -hmm. And almost like I manifested this just from like my own interest. So I guess just it's so trite, but just like be yourself and have fun on social and and something crazy might happen. Bon Appetit comes to mind because they had their like traditional media side and then they launched the video side and yeah. a lot of those people took off and got very popular in their own socials and then things kind of fell apart over there to a degree and some of those people were able to have careers afterwards yeah. just because they had built up their socials. Well, I'll say it gets tough because there is that like, um, I don't know, internal competition amongst people, especially if some people start taking off on social and then you have this other job in here. And I, I think you see that even in like the political realm with like journalists on Twitter and things like that. Like it's just, a, it's the social media has completely changed the landscape and you're always better off if you have a social following to fall back on because you never know what's going to happen in this industry. Yeah. And it, it's good to be in control of, of your, it's kind of a resume. You know, it is, and it's an easy, like, yeah, like a resume portfolio to show. And, um, it, it's, it really is a, something that I'll always have for me. Um, and even just going back and watching like my old videos from years ago, it's just funny to see how far you've come. And I'm sure you feel the same way about like your content and how your business has evolved. It's just, you have this portfolio of your professional life that is all in one spot. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Lots of changes and... Sometimes I cringe pretty hard when I go back and watch old stuff, but it's there and I'm not going to take it down. You know what I mean? Oh, I would. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, well, I, I scrubbed... I did scrub that blog, I, my aforementioned blog I was talking about. <laughs> it's gone. Thankfully, because I was like, also, I was working at people and I was like, man, I was like pretty ruthless in this blog saying like, <laughs> like, like yeah. crazy things that I would only say, like, I was like, I don't want anyone to find this. No, I scrubbed all my personal 
social media except for one or two accounts. I had a personal blog too. I'm like, I don't need people looking for that. So we'll no. just delete. <laughs> within within, within uh, uh, boundaries, I'll keep stuff up. Uh-huh. Um, do you have to actively work at staying on top of like current food trends? Yeah, but I'm also not as into that. Like, I got really fatigued from that working at people. It was like every day you wake up, I have to check every food site, everything to see what's going on. What's like, what's the viral moment? What's the recipe that's happening right now? What's like the food, the cronut, like the cronut was really big when I first, that's how old I am. It's like the cronut was big when I first started. <laughs> but, um, and the cronut and- feels fairly recent to me. We are different ages. <laughs> well that was like 2012 the cronut and now there's all but it's so funny how food trends kind of getting off topic but how food trends just come back around because now i see all these like 20 year old tiktokers being like this viral big croissant at this new york city bakery i'm like that's just a cronut baby we've come full circle like it's all the same yeah but they also call like leggings flared yoga pants or something right they just every, it's the everything's fashion it's like everything's they, new <laughs> you're creating new words for things that have already existed <laughs> that's right um, you know listen so let them let them have their moment i think some people I, I used to try to be like oh this recipe is trending i should make it and put it on tiktok and now i'm like do i really want to make the same recipe that everybody else is making or do i want to like do my own thing and i think it's more interesting yeah sometimes you you can jump on a trend and you get a lot of views and that's good but Mm -hmm. uh it's not as quite as exciting for me i think the trends that you stay on top of are more like the latest flavor of cheetos or something right i I actually (laughs) that's a series that's had to fall by the wayside but i was doing it for a while and i'm gonna i need to pick back up because people always ask me like the five new foods of the week where it was like craziest you know, new Oreos, new whatever, or Wendy's frosty creamsicle. Yeah, like good. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's not a lot of pre- there's no pretentiousness to what you're doing. It's it's a no. lot of like fun, approachable content. Yeah, that's always been my thing. Is I really and that, and don't get me wrong, I would have loved to have worked at Bon Appetit if you asked me when I first started. Um. But I love the trajectory I ended up taking because it didn't require me to be pretentious about mm-hmm. or to like know the, you know the hottest restaurant and so far as like besides like where a celebrity is going. But it, I, I was really allowed to have fun, write about Oreos, write about Disney World, and um, I do love and I, I like I like fine dining. I like nice restaurants. I like mm-hmm. I like luxury travel on occasion, but uh. I also, I grew up eating fast food and junk mm-hmm. food. My parents, like, they're great. They didn't have any restrictions on me at all. I was like, I was like one of those McDonald's after school every day kids. So um, uh, I do try to eat better now, even though eat yes. right that on my socials. But, um, uh, I, I, I do often wonder about that. I'm like, how are you eating all this stuff and, and staying healthy? Because it's a lot. But um, I, I, always, I always try to say, you know, it's like a highlight reel more than anything. And you know, I'm always traveling with my husband or with friends and sharing. And um, it, I, I cook a lot at home. I cook a lot of healthy stuff at home. I sometimes film it, but I'm like, nobody really cares about this. <laughs> yeah, about the healthy stuff. They want the fun stuff. Yeah, um, I, I, I was writing a review of eating at Victoria and Albert Chef's table while eating Taco Bell. And I feel like that purposely encapsulates who I am personally. <laughs> I love that. And if I'm going to be frank, I would prefer to talk about to the Victorian Alberts. That's just me, though. That's I like me. I like both. And you were speaking of pretentiousness. This is something I've been saying a lot lately is that I love nice things. But when you're doing them in Disney spaces, nobody can be pretentious. We're in a theme park, like oh. settle down or at a theme park. <laughs> so Dorian and Alberts, Dorian Alberts is the one place where I did feel, oh, first of all, I was underdressed when I went and mm-hmm. I have a jacket. I, I looked okay, but it was under. But I, let me, let me I say was, something interesting about Victoria and Alberts though, because yeah. the chef's table is the hardest to get because there's only one. 
but it is much more casual than the main dining room. They let me go back and see it. I didn't get to eat there, but they let me go back and look at it. And I was like, this is cool. Like, I'm it's a, so cool. Next time I want to do that because the, 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 if I'm being honest, I felt the main dining room was too stuffy for me. Yeah. Um, but I love the chef's table, the vibe of it. It looks just was really. It is. You still have the dress code because it's just the restaurant's right. dress code, but you're in the kitchen and it's so laid back and you're just talking to everybody. And it, it's just much more like friendly and not as uptight. And I don't think that's very intuitive to imagine that that's what the experience would be like. I hated not having a jacket. Well, I have been coming off another trip. We spontaneously went to Disney and ha- got a Victorian Outdoor Reservation. I didn't bring a jacket with me. And I was like, am I going to buy a jacket? And, all that? and then I was like, no, it's just fine. I'll just. I'll just go with what I have. And it was, it was, it was fine. I just felt a little underdressed and was self-conscious about that the entire meal, but it's okay. It is. And the, the nicer restaurants that are in the parks aren't as stuffy on their, uh, their uh, attire because you're in a theme park. So what are you going to do? Walk into Epcot with a suit? I'm like, are you going to show up to Epcot in a... No. Or to Kimi Kimi Tai? Like, no, we're not wearing a a whole suit from head to toe for that. But Graham Floridian, they can do whatever. But so including Disney, you've, you've visited a lot of different places because travel's part of your thing. Um, which place has been like a favorite or has had the best food? Oh, the best food. Okay. Well, I mean, this is cliche, but Italy has the best food. I, I just, I'm just like an Italian food lover. I'm like, and okay, we went to this place called Ischia. Last summer, I've done a couple of videos about it. I fell in love. So you fly into Naples and a lot of people go to Capri, but you can also take a ferry to Ischia, which is like a sort of lesser known of the two islands. It's a volcanic island. Um, Stanley Tucci went there on one of his episodes of that show, if you, if you like that show. And um, they have just the most beautiful spa resorts that are like all woven into these volcanic structures or whatever and there's this restaurant and i can't remember the name of it but stanley took she went there and um they serve you this rabbit this whole rabbit cooked in like so much garlic and white wine and tomatoes and like then like potatoes at the bottom and i saw that on stanley Tucci and i was like i have to go get that and it's just in the middle of this island this family-run restaurant. I wish I could remember the name, but that was one of the best meals I've ever had. Uh, definitely go to Ischia. I just got back from Puerto Rico for my husband's birthday. We only went mm. to San Juan, though. We, we found a $59 flight on Frontier from Tampa, and we were already up in Tampa, so we were like, hey, let's hop on. Um, the food there was fantastic, mm-hmm. and I can't wait to go back. Um, I'm kind of a... Just my travel is not as well planned out as it might seem. I'm more of a last minute deal kind of guy, but yeah, we're going, oh, and Paris is coming up. So there's, I have some things on the horizon. Yeah. When we get to uh, Disney stuff, I want to hear about your plans for Paris. Cause I know you're going to be okay. going there to Disney in Paris. Yeah. So Italy, that restaurant in Italy was one of your favorite meals, but is Italy also a favorite place to just visit? Yeah, I love it. I mean, when I'm going there, I feel like I am constantly traveling because I want to see a bunch of new places. Um, like, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm like, oh, I really like this place. I'm going to go spend a week there. It's more like I'm still like, I feel like I just always have to explore and go all around and take the trains and pack up every night. and <laughs> Things like that. Um, as far as places that I visit more regular i love puerto vallarta i don't know if you've ever been there in mexico puerto vallarta is amazing they have amazing food that's actually where james and i got engaged Mm -hmm. uh, at a restaurant called casa kimberly which is where it's the old home of richard burton and elizabeth taylor and they had his home on one side of the street and her home on the other side of the street because they built her a separate house because they were drunkenly fighting so much. And they have a bridge that connects the two. And so his site is now a restaurant and a hotel. And so it, you, you can walk along. It's called the Lover's Bridge. 
And that's where James proposed to me on the uh-huh. bridge where they would meet. <laughs> but, that's uh, so fun. I saw, I think I saw pictures and videos, but I didn't know that was the story. Yeah. So it's a cute story. That's probably the like destination we go to most often. And I love the food in Mexico. Oh, and Sayulita is probably my favorite food destination. It's 45 minutes from Puerto Vallarta. We usually will stay a couple nights there. They have the best tacos, just like street tacos, super affordable and beautiful. And that's another place that I definitely recommend. Have you ever been to Mexico City? No, uh, except for the airport. And I would, it's, I'm dying to go. James, not without me. I'm dying to go. I went by myself and it was incredible. I hear that's the food is just incredible. That's just an awesome vibe. The food and the people. Yeah. Like the people are so, so kind. And, uh, y- you know, here, if I get an Uber or something, I'm always a little skeptical of how it's going to go there. Everyone was so nice. It helps yeah. if you know Spanish, but I, I, know, I don't. I know. Un poquito de I know. Poquito. James is fluent because he lived in Ecuador for a while. So I like to have him with me as my guide. It um, does help there because they a hundred percent of my experiences there where they were they knew how to speak English, but they were not interested in speaking English with me. But they were going to help me with my Spanish, so I they like were that. So they I were like nice. That. They were nice. When you um, go to like the coastal resort towns, it's more just like everyone just speaks English. Mm-hmm. You don't have to really know anything. Well, in my experience in big cities around the world, is that almost everybody is fluent in English, so they're willing to speak it. But there, they were like, "No, no, no, you're going to speak our language," <laughs> which which uh, is fair. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I got better very and, quickly. You know, uh, yeah, growing up in Texas, you know, I had, I took Spanish. Mm-hmm whole growing up i should know it better but i can understand it it's just also the nerves like i get nervous talking and when you're not used to doing that yeah i think if, and if i say for like a month or something maybe i could get i could get more used to it i fully went to a speakeasy where you had to show up and have a code word to get in and i don't even speak spanish fluently i like i'm like here it's like in high school and i'm like what was i thinking doing this but I did get I did get in, but I was like, I don't even know how to communicate with this person that's at the door. But it was uh, I got in eventually. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you got in. That would be it, sad. It was just very nerve wracking. But anyway, so let's talk next level chef. So you were on that last year. It aired last year. Did you also film it last year? Oh, uh, yeah, I did. I I filmed. I, Wait, what? I'm like, what year is it? October? I would have filmed October of last uh, year. No, 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 no. Because it aired. It aired. It aired in January of last year. Or, yes, during the Super Bowl, it launched. So it's the, been... The year before. Uh, the year before, the October of the year before. Uh, okay, then. so a few months before you filmed it, and then it started on the Super Bowl date, which is pretty iconic. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was really yeah. fun. We had like the best time slot. So that actually ended up being, I think, the most watched cooking show episode ever, just mostly because people left on the TV after the Super Bowl. But yeah. Well, still say it. It was still fun to say. But you said earlier you didn't like the high pressure kitchen situation. And not only is Gordon Ramsay himself an intense person, but this show to me is the most intense. Yeah, it was really intense. And I wasn't prepared. So the process, they reached out to me because they saw my socials and I did a bunch of, I did like three, uh, two phone interviews, one Zoom interview, didn't hear back for like four months. So I assume, you know, nothing happened. Um, and then I get a call. They're like, we want me to do one more interview over the phone. And then can you fly to London next week? And I'm like, oh, uh, okay, sure. And so I do this interview and then I ended up getting chosen to go to London, which is where we shot. Although, oh, I didn't realize it was shot there. Yeah. Well, they make it seem, I might get in trouble. No, they make it seem like it's shot in Vegas. And the first season was shot in Vegas. The second season we shot in London. Uh, but they didn't, for some reason, show that on the show. They showed shots of Vegas. Anyway, it's in London. Um, and, we so so I fly there, and even when we get there, they're like, "Okay, we're still gonna cut four people before we even start filming the show." So they did like screen tests and had us like tell our stories, and 
do like promos for the show and <laughs> like show off our knife skills mm-hmm. and stuff. And then the night we didn't know until the night before we we're going to start filming the next morning, whether or not we we're going to be on the show. So that was obviously a very intense situation and it only got more intense from there, as I'm sure you saw. Yeah. And for people that aren't familiar, there's three types of chefs on it's professional home cook and social media chefs. So you were obviously one of the social media chefs um, and the food it comes for like what, 30 seconds or something, it arrives and you have to just grab it off the platform and then go make whatever the theme of that that dish is. Yeah, so there's like three levels, uh, the top level kitchen, the middle kitchen, the bottom kitchen. Top level is pristine, state of the art, has all the equipment you could ever want. Middle kitchen is like nice stuff, nothing too flashy. Basement kitchen is trash. There's, it's mm-hmm. really, and it's, you see it on the show, it's horrible. Like. The stuff they give us, dull knives, these beaten up pots and pans, burners that barely work. What you see on the show is 100% true. Basement kitchen is terrible. So you don't want to be in the basement. Um, The first episode, you're randomly chosen where you go. I was, of course, in the basement. Um, And then, like you were saying, you you had each level has 30 seconds to pick. They'll they'll give you a, a theme for the week, say it's Mexican. And then they bring down a platform with tons of ingredients on it and you have to run to it and grab as many as you can carry in your hand within 30 seconds. And those are the only ingredients that you can use to cook with. Wait, I have a question about that. So there's nothing outside of that that you can use. Okay, there's... wait. Oh, I exaggerated. We had, here's what we had. Like oil to cook mm-hmm. with. Oil and butter. Um, there were spices and like salt and pepper flour and i think i can't remember you know just very basic so there's okay. maybe baking like like baking powder or something like that if you want big because otherwise you can't really that's not something you can grab um but just the, the very basics and then um but like even when we had like an asian challenge or whatever there wasn't soy sauce or anything like that. So you would have to grab that. And if you don't grab that, then you're like, screw it. Because I'm not the way do this. Yeah. And some people end up with like two or three things. And they're like, I don't know how to make a whole meal out of this because and it's like, hard. I always, I was a pretty good grabber, I would say. I don't know if I was, there was, there was, I had other flaws, but you know, you could, I was pretty good at grab. But some people just grabbed everything and other people would mm-hmm. grab like three things. Mm-hmm. And they really want you to use everything that you grab. Okay. But some people, I'm gonna say we're not using everything that they. Uh huh. I wondered about that because I was like, why not just grab everything? There must be rules. That was sort of the strategy, and then they were like, "Hey guys, stop grabbing everything." <laughs> like, well, you, they're like, "You'll be penalized if you don't use everything." And they didn't quite let like some people still fudge the rules a little bit, but yeah. Because so after. Also- because after it goes to you, it goes to the other floors. And so they have to grab whatever's left. And then the last one so has to grab. The, the other bad thing about being in the bottom is the top two kitchens get their first pick of all the ingredients uh-huh. with whatever's left. It it stresses me out so much just watching it. <laughs> that first episode when we filmed, I was like, oh, my God, I should have brought a Xanax. I'm like a panic attack. Like, I'm just uh-huh. like Well, and also gonna... you're on TV and they're asking you questions as you're cooking very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're coming into your face like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What's like, what's your game plan? And I'm like, I literally don't know. I just, I, this is, I just there's a camera on my face right here. I just, lights my eyes. There's a celebrity chef yelling in my face and I'm like trying to make meatballs. It was, it was like, it was, I'm so glad I did it, but it was the most intense experience of my life very easily. Okay, I, I it looked like it. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I, I've actually like, thought to myself, how would I prepare? Like, I would practice like chopping really quickly and perfecting the grabs. I'm like, there's so many different things. I didn't have time because I didn't think they were going to pick me. Like, they didn't tell yeah, me yeah. before. So, like, James and I are in the kitchen. Like, in two days before I'm going to London, and he's like, "All right, let's find you 30 minutes." He went to the grocery store and got a bunch of random yeah. ingredients and had been like time me 30 minutes to make a dish, and we did that like three times. And I was like, all right, that's you didn't you didn't have time for anything else. That's all I can do. And 
you know, uh, it, what you see is what you get. And on the show, the other element of it was that like, we were like pretty strictly not allowed to leave our hotel rooms ever except to go to set. So I was there for a month and I never saw anything except for the holiday and room we were in and the set, like we didn't get to go anywhere else. So it was a little maddening. They don't let you have your phone on set. So you're kind of cut off from everybody for the whole 12 hour days you're shooting. You don't get to socialize with the other chefs? No, you do, but they would have, we weren't allowed to go to each other's rooms. They would have like designated social hours uh, a couple times a week where we could like go watch a movie and they would have like snacks. Mm Mm-hmm. And we all became like best. We're all, everyone of us is still on a text chain together. Like we all became great friends and every single one of them to my wedding. Um, cause it was sort of trauma bonding in a weird way. Cause we were all just like psych a lot. And that's why, you know, you have breakdowns, you cry, you do. Yeah. Think- but it was a great cast. We were, I mean, I'm biased, but I was like, we had the best cast. And I was so like, I just like loved. We really loved each other and we had like became a little family. So, yeah, it's 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 worth following people still online because it was such a great cast. Um, I am particularly fond of Teeny, who is a very she's like in her early 20s. To me, she makes cooking look really fun. Because it's so casual. She's in her early 20s. She's incredible. She is. She is. She's explains things, but she's just so like she's that merger of like Gen Z TikToker and culinary skills. And I just she's think so she's talented and I adore her. I adore her. Um she first met her, I was like, this girl is crazy. She's like, I was like, it's just it, it took us a while to sort of warm to each other. And now like she's just one of my favorite people. And a huge Disney person as well. I've been, oh. I've been to Disney with her. And it gave me a little bit of a complex because normally when I go to Disney, I'm the one getting recognized. Oh, but it was um, teeny. And everyone, and I, people were stopping us. And I'm like, hey, they're like, teeny. And I was like, oh, this is my territory. Come on, let me have this at least. That's fun though. She, she's, she's loves- fantastic. Yeah. So how is Gordon Ramsay in real life? Really super nice, really super mm-hmm. nice. And mm-hmm. my uh, mentor was Naisha Arrington, so I didn't work with him as much on the show. Um, but, you know, when the cameras are off, we didn't we interact a ton. They also don't want you to really interact with the judges off camera so much because they want most of the things that happen to be on the show, obviously. Um, I just went to the opening of his restaurant, Lucky Cat in Miami. Fantastic restaurant. He was there. And so he was like so nice. We chatted for a long time and, you know, he does all of the, he does so many shows. Obviously it's like, he shouldn't remember every cast member on like all 10 shows he does a year, but he was super, super, super nice. Yeah. It's, it's funny because, um, I'm a huge fan of RuPaul's Drag Race and there's a ton of those seasons on and, um, and and Gordon always has shows on, but RuPaul doesn't remember anybody. <laughs> but Gordon does. Well, I had to, I was like, I have to jog Gordon's memory, but he was, then he gave me, like, he remembered certain details about So I was, you know, I was impressed. He was very nice. But yeah, I, I, I can't imagine being in that position, even trying to remember names or stories of all these people. Yeah, it's a lot. But he did spend, you know, a solid month with you guys. Yeah. Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. Okay, so then let's talk Disney because that's been woven throughout 
everything that you've done. When did you first become a Disney person? Disney person. Well, I guess when I was a kid, I mean, we, we did Disney trips regularly. Um, I, my first trip to Disney, I was, I think, one, maybe not even. I don't know. Like my family went. Because I have two older sisters. One of them is 10 years older than me. The other is six years older than me. So they were like the Disney going age. And I think like our first family trip, they, she, my sister might have been 10. I was just six and I was like, just so mm -hmm. we, I don't remember that. But uh, and then as my sisters got older and my dad and I would go at least once a year sometimes because my dad traveled for work, I would say like four or five days a week all the like all the time so he would just i didn't get to see him a ton so it was like very special he would come home and sometimes just like surprise me take me out of school take me to disney just the two of us and those are like some of the best memories i have as a kid that's nice and, um it and then i went on a hiatus like as an adult i didn't go back for until i was maybe like i think from the time like between the years of 16 and 25 i never went back and uh, then i got and then i would like that was ignited the whole thing the of the whole world of disney that i know now which i didn't know when i was a kid you know so it's just always been there and then at people magazine you became the disney person and then your content related that it, part yeah, of well, so, so that first time I went when I went on, I was like 25, I was working at Rachel Ray still. Mm -hmm. And I did end up writing a little something about it for the magazine. I can't remember what, but then I was like, oh, I could like maybe make a link <laughs> writing about Disney. And I started meeting uh, other like Disney bloggers and Disney people who cover Disney. And I did, and that was when I was like, oh, I, there's like a job in this. Mm -hmm. And so that, once I started working at people and got comfortable there and I was pitching, I was just constantly pitching Disney stuff. And as I said, luckily there was a huge interest in it and the mm -hmm. articles were doing really well. So they let me keep doing it. And I just kind of carved out that niche and that allowed me to go to Disney a lot. Did you happen to see the Gawker series where they went and ate? I think uh, it was. That Epcot. Ep one, Epcot. Which Joe mm -hmm. and Katie, what was her name? Uh, web, uh, 88. she's a great writer. Katie Weaver. I, yes. Um, and whenever people yeah. write about Disney stuff that aren't huge fans, it kind of irritates me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So that was before I read that. And I was like, I sent it to my sister cause she loves Epcot. And that was like, I was like, we need to go back to Epcot. Like we haven't been as adults and we're both adults. And like, that would be so fun. And uh, yeah, that, I remember reading that whole series, but at the time I was not like an expert by any means. I was just kind of like reading it and I can't even remember like the, the meat of it, but I remember that, that, that was like a good, uh, it, I won't for, an article for me. I'll never forget it because I like them as writers, but I, I just hated their take. I'm like, just don't well, go if you don't like it. It's always sort of like lampooning or like making fun mm -hmm. a little or, or trying to be above it mm -hmm. but still going and i'm like just embrace it or and i don't i actually don't remember what the article was like anymore but uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't a very gawker take on it i would imagine it, it was it was as m many things were back then um <laughs> So, do you have favorite Disney World restaurants? Absolutely. Um, I just went. I just went to try some of the new menu items at Flying Fish. Flying Fish is, I think, maybe the most underrated restaurant at Disney. Mm -hmm. Really, really like not only the food there. I think the service there is better than any other Disney restaurant. They, it just feels fine dining, but also like casual and friendly and lovely um and the potato wrapped snapper have you had that i don't remember if that's what i had i just have always liked everything i've had there the potato wrapped snapper if i could tell you one dish to go eat at disney world if you want like a nice night out it's just, it's expensive it's almost like 60 dollars, mm -hmm. but so good and they just got a new menu and i tried the other stuff 
And it was fine. It's good. But I just, I was like, you you kept the potato wrap snapper, right? And they were like, yes. So I was like, I'll have that. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's so good. Um, I mean, you say $60 well, is expensive, but that's yeah. how much character meals cost. <laughs> well, right, right, right. I mean, we're in Disney. I, yeah. I'm like so used to TikTok commenters being like, I can't believe you would spend that. Um, so I don't understand the context of this. Exactly. And that is every platform has its own personality and TikTok people have a hard time with the prices. <laughs> they have a hard time. And I have to say, I, I put prices on all my videos because I think it's helpful. But I also do it for the engagement because everyone, I want everyone to be fighting about the prices and the comments. That is so smart. Well, always put a price. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, flying fish I love. Gosh. And um, I do love Topolino's. I will for, say. For breakfast and dinner? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, my last trip, I did breakfast at Topolino's. Um, they changed to where you could like, you know, they used to be able to order multiple entrees. Now mm -hmm. you could, they still let me get the sour cream waffle on the side. Um, but not two entrees. What? But not two entrees. Not two entrees, which I'm like, I, I don't really need to order two entrees anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the steak and eggs there is so good. The wood fired steak and eggs, it comes with these like very crispy potatoes creamy polenta and it's like a filet beautifully mine was perfectly cooked and you have the like creamy polenta and the crispy potato sort of textural contrast with that like very well cooked steak it's delicious um and i think that's the best character breakfast mm -hmm. definitely in terms of food and it's i think the least expensive if you're if you're talking like chef mickey's ohana all the like main deluxe resort character breakfast so for me, that's that's the move. I like their dinner a lot. I've always been a big fan of the rigatoni. Um, yeah, that's what we, that's what I had last time. Good. Yeah, they've they've changed the menu a little bit. They used to have this veal chop I liked. Last time I went, they didn't have that. Um. Okay, so I've got Topolino's. I've got flying fish, and. I really, really liked my meal at Shikisai, the new uh, newest spot in Japan Pavilion in Epcot. I had a great meal there. Um, I loved it. And then people hate me, hate on me, but I just my favorite restaurant is Sci Fi Dine In because that was the only place I remember eating when I was a kid. <laughs> and I still love to go there. And I think it's fine. I like the burgers, I like the shakes, and I think people overcomplicate it like trying to order crazy menu items and they're like, oh, it's really bad. I'm like, uh, the burger's fine. The shake's great. And it's the most fun rest, like the best. I just, I just love the ambiance and the theming. And you're in a theme park. I want fun theming at a restaurant. Yeah, it's just, and it's, for you, it's nostalgic, but it's also really well themed, so. It's so well themed and it really is because it's so funny with all the Disney trips we took as a kid. I don't remember eating anything except for like Mickey ice cream bars like we weren't a foodie family if that makes sense mm -hmm. like we didn't like plan like my we would just like maybe on the fly sit somewhere or my parents would just grab us like a mickey pretzel or something they weren't like like doing anything crazy making fancy restaurant reservations the only place we would go was sci-fi so i like i love it i love it so much it makes sense why you still love it if that's what you did when you were a kid when I was a kid, um, I, it was before the internet was a thing, but um, it, I think the internet make everything take off and be more competitive. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot different now. The only thing I remember from when I was a kid was uh, what used it, before Garden Grill, it was called something else. And I just remembered like how cool it was to sit in a restaurant that spun. <laughs> Potato restaurants. Yeah. Restaurants are cool when you're a kid. Like I remember going, so to, cool. I remember going to Dallas and eating at the rotating restaurant. At the reunion tower? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, same vibes. But as a kid, this the 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 fun factor there. I don't know anything about the food, but it was fun to spin. So that was good. Do you have a favorite Epcot festival? Flower and Garden. Mm -hmm. My favorite by far. I love the topiaries. I love the butterfly. I love. I like the food probably best there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I just and it's like springtime. It's like nice. Mm -hmm. It's a. It's a 
before spring break or after spring break, but it's, you know, it's nice. Um, it's funny because food and wine, I think, is my least favorite. Me too. Festivals. And By I think far. that's become a common thing amongst Disney people because it's like every festival is a food and wine festival. Exactly. And it's so confusing to me why food and wine is so popular with the locals. Like it's hard to, you know, be there on a Friday, Saturday because of the locals. But I'm uh, like, a flower and garden is so much better and it still has food and wine. I love it. And I love the festival of the holidays is a close second just because I'm a big Christmas guy. I'm very into the holidays. I go buck wild for the holidays and, you know, it's short and sweet, but I love it. And then, uh, yeah, I like Festival of the Arts fine. It's not, it's not necessarily for me. Um, uh, I like Broadway performers. So that part of it is yeah. really fun. And the food is creative in its presentation, at least. It is. It is. It's cool. And the weather. And the weather. Okay. You know what? You're convincing me. I'm, I'm getting, <laughs> getting there. Getting really? There. Food and wine just the worst. That's all you want to know. the worst. <laughs> no, it's fine. I just, I, I'm a little just fatigued from it. I don't know. I for, like the, the flower and garden, I don't get fatigued from because I just love seeing the topiaries around. And then I miss them when they're not there, you know? Yeah. 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 And they shortened it back this year. So the summer travelers will not be seeing all of that. Sad. Sad for them. Super sad. So you just came out with a food guide. Yes. Can you explain how you decided to do that and what it is? Well, my friend who worked at People With Me started this company where you can like create your own guides to various cities, like some, they have some guides to like, she's from Philadelphia. So she, she did a guide to Philadelphia and like, there's, there's just a few on the platform. Um, she wanted, she came to me to sort of be like, we want a Disney guide and we want someone to do it. And like, you're the person <laughs> that we want. Um, so it's really cool what they've done. It's, um, like on your phone, once you, once you bought the guide, you have access to all, right now I have. 225 restaurant reviews on there that show not only like my favorite menu items, but photos, sorry, excuse me, photos and um, like little insider tips and what menu items I don't like. <laughs> so it's all very, I can be very honest. And the cool part is when you're in the parks, you actually have the map of each restaurant and you can just click on it and it shows from your location. Like if you're right by Sunshine Tree Terrace, you click on Sunshine Tree Terrace, pulls up all my favorite menu items there, what you should order. The orange cream float is my favorite there. And um, not only that, but I, I just created my first itinerary, which is eating and drinking around the world itinerary that you follow step by step. Not only my favorite little snacks, my favorite drinks, my favorite shops and mm -hmm. what I like buy at the shops and it's just kind of like a, an easy guide to follow and i'm going to do i have like another itinerary coming out of the deluxe resort hopping day i'm going to tell you what i did this was <laughs> on my last trip so it's the ultimate deluxe resort hopping itinerary you start at the riviera you can either you know do a you, you could do topolinos or you could just have a little pastry and a coffee take skyliner over to the Epcot area, go to Yacht and Beach Club. Mm -hmm. I think I got a little Beaches and Cream Milkshake. Then walk over to Boardwalk. And I like to kind of sneak into the pool area of Boardwalk because I love the carousel bar there. Um, and then you take the boat to Hollywood Studios. From there, you take the bus to Animal Kingdom Lodge, lunch at Sanaa, one, uh, bus and buzz back to you, Animal Kingdom. You said, you said no Ubers. <laughs> We're using no Disney Uber. transportation. No Ubers. No Ubers. This is all Disney transportation. We're talking planes, trains, and automobiles. No, like <laughs> Skyline, boat, <laughs> bus, monorail. So we go so we Animal Kingdom Lodge, had lunch at Sanaa, um, bus over to Animal Kingdom, bus to Wilderness, have some drinks over at Geyser Point, mm -hmm. boat to Contemporary. You can take it straight mm -hmm. to Contemporary from Wilderness. Mm hmm. And then uh, at the contemporary, I think I just went to like the shop. I love the, the uh, what's the shop in the, the main shop there. Anyway, 
bought mm-hmm. some stuff there and then finished Polynesian Grand Floridian all in one day. So it's the ultimate deluxe resort hopping itinerary. And these are things that I'm coming out with weekly that I'll have mapped out on this guide. So um, once you buy it once, you have it forever for every time nice. I update it. You don't have to do a monthly fee rate thing. Every time I update it, you get the new itinerary. And I am giving a little $5 off discount code for your listeners. So, Which is uh, very I nice. Think, I think and it's great. And I think it's such a... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great idea. It feels like um, a great addition to all the planning resources that people might want for a trip. Exactly. And it's just like, I mean, uh, it's... I love the map aspect of it because you can literally press find places near me. And if you're in Disney Springs, I have, I think, almost every restaurant in Disney Springs, except for I haven't, I've never eaten at T-Rex. I've drank at the Shark Bar, okay. (laughs) But T-Rex is the one place that I'm like still holding out on. It's okay. Uh, I'll get there next time. There's a lot of places to eat in Disney Springs. There's a lot of places, but I found it like when I when I wasn't traveling there, like the first time I went, I was so overwhelmed as an adult and, um, to just like be able to have a guide to take you through. And I think the itineraries are really helpful too, because I'm going to start doing the best itineraries in each park, each resort. And yeah, so I'm biased, but I think it's great. And I hope that I hope you all all like it. Yes. And so the way to get the discount is through the link that you're providing and it will automatically apply yes okay the link which i think you can provide Mm -hmm. uh, it'll because right now it's 29.95 and again once you have it you have it for life Mm -hmm. ever and every time i go like last time i went to disney i did 30 restaurant updates just from one week trip um so i'm constantly updating it with the new menu items with you know my new opinions because sometimes opinions change you know (laughs) You go to That's a restaurant the- sometimes at Disney. There's some inconsistency there, but you got to be aware of that. There uh, sure is. I've been going, you know, I've been going once or twice a month and really like focusing on these guides. So that was actually why I haven't done that much of Flower and Garden this year because I've been focusing more on um, just like the permanent stuff mm-hmm. and s- restaurants and stands for this guide. But in the future... I'll incorporate guides to every festival in addition. And again, once you have it, you'll get the guide to every festival. I love that. So yeah, for people listening, that link will be in the show notes and I'll be using the same link to to get my copy. Sorry, $29.95, but it's $5 off for this. this, uh, And I think we'll have it up for like a week. So just click the link. and Okay, so do it as soon as possible. Well, I can I can extend it. <laughs> oh, I mean, if it's infinite or short, we just need to know so we can let people actually that, that'll inspire yeah, them to. Scratch the link. I'll just let you have the I'll just let you. I don't need to just have the link. OK, yeah. Um, my podcast episodes are fairly evergreen. So sometimes people do binge older episodes. So I just wanted to put a, a time oh, frame yeah, on it. No, this this is this is good. as good forever. OK, now now that you've done this for Disney World. Do you have any thoughts on doing it for other locations? That's the plan. Uh, I'm actually working on Universal and Key West, the Florida Keys in, as a whole. Because uh-huh. those are sort of my three specialty areas right now. Like, obviously, I live in the Keys and I, I do a lot of Keys content. I do a ton of Universal content. I go to Universal almost as often as Disney. I love Universal. Um, You're about and, to love it even more next year. I don't know if that's controversial on this podcast, but I'm a big Universal guy as well. Yeah. Um, we talk about Universal uh, fairly often. Don't love it as much as Disney, but I think I next guess. year it might change. It's so, there's so much happening. They just announced, I was just looking at the press release about the two mm-hmm. new hotels too. Mm-hmm. I didn't really get to read them, but. They're, one's opening January. Yeah. They're, they're moving fast and Disney yeah. keep up, baby. They can't keep up. I know. Everything mm-hmm. takes a while with the Disney. The world uh, is well, I'm, I'm so hyped about Epic Universe. I'm so hyped about. So, yeah, I will have I have Universal coming out probably in the next month or so. OK. And, and um, the keys at some point I'm going to bundle them all. But that's not. Happening yet. Well, we'll keep an eye out for those because obviously Universal has a lot of crossover with the Disney people. So 
Yeah. And I, and people really hate on the universal food, but I found a lot of good stuff there. I really, and oh, I, I've eaten almost everywhere at universal, I think at this point. There's definitely some good food there for sure. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, well, that sounds good. I will use the link myself to go get a copy and just have it forever. Yay. Yes. Well, thanks for talking to me today, Shay. Of course. This was so fun. And I appreciate you inviting me. And I love to chat Disney, I'll chat everything. So this was great. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I thought Shay was such a delight. So easy to talk to you. And I love being able to jump off social media and have an actual conversation um, so we could learn a little bit more about each other. As we mentioned, there is a link that is in the show notes just for WW Prep people to save $5 on Shay's new guide. I think that'll wrap up this episode of WW Prep to Go. For more information, please check the show notes in your podcast app or head to the website, wdwprepschool.com. Click on podcast at the top, scroll down to episode 405. Until next time, I will see you on the site. has arrived. Tickets are on sale now for the Tony and Pulitzer Prize winning musical, Hamilton in Lincoln at the Leeds Center for Performing Arts. Get tickets at leedcenter.org.